the conservation of energy states that energy can neither get created nor destroyed. Uh, it only changes form. Uh, our energy comes from the sun and it's the source of our life. Uh, but there's the thing about energy in that before you can use it, you actually have to be able to store it before you can actually use it when it, con it, it converts form. And the way we on the earth are able to use the sun and the way the earth, sun's energy is stored on the earth is actually because of water. Uh, and that happens, the, what is able to save the sun energy because it changes into a gas when it's hot and then it freezes when it's cold. So when the sun pretty much hits the water, the water vaporizes and starts evaporizing. And when it evaporates, uh, pretty much it leaves an area of low, uh, low pressure and winds come in and they move uh, the vapor away. And when it hits the land, pretty much it goes and turns into clouds, uh, condenses, turns into rain, uh, rain goes back, becomes rivers, uh, sometimes you get infiltration and some of the water goes under the earth and pretty much goes back to the ocean. So there's the whole cycle based on pretty much the water heating up and cooling. Uh, because of that, a lot of plankton comes into the ocean and plankton pretty much started feeding all the life and uh, you can imagine, I mean, uh, there's so much plankton that it actually supports the biggest life forms. All the biggest mammals actually live in the water and out of that, uh, pretty much trees started growing in the land, uh, fish came in the water and uh, life forms that pretty much clean up by feeding on the bottom, bottom feeders and bacteria come in. So my point is we don't have to do anything in the ocean. We don't have to add water, we don't have to feed our fish, we don't have to add air pumps, uh, everything sustains itself. So I feel like if that's a model we can copy, we can actually build sustainable systems based off the model of the earth. So the easiest way I can think of implementing such a model is, uh, one, take a tank so that we can pretty much mimic the ocean, uh, get our water and fish inside the tank, uh, uh, create somewhere where we can mimic our art, in this case a raised bed, because I don't want to pay it. I don't want to bend, I want to be comfortable when I deal with it. Uh, and then I can add water pumps, which pretty much end up simulating the all uh, water motion, which is generated again through the sun's energy, either through solar or all some forms of electricity. Uh, and then I can take the bacteria, which was cleaning up everything at the bottom of the ocean, and pretty much put it in the grow bed. So I can, I can pretty much simulate this man-made environment that represents what happens in the ocean. So I can model one-on-one -on -one so that I can build like a sustainable uh, system. But the thing is, how do we break it? The easiest way I can think of breaking this model is pretty much uh, adding one of those people, adding humans. The minute you add a human in, the big sustainable model things start going wrong. For instance, they start building farms because they need food. Sooner, we have more and more humans and they build more and more farms. Uh, side consequence of that is that when it rains, you get all these nutrients going to the water and they create like a lot of fertilizer. So you get like say more plankton and more plants in the water, which uh, ends up leading to like oxygen depletion and you fish die and your plants die and you end up breaking uh, that model. Uh, the same way I can think of breaking that model in, we can break the same model that we created out of uh, our equipment again by introducing humans. When I introduce humans to my little model that I recreated again, uh, end up having problems like for instance I might not feed my fish on time, I may not uh, add water on time, I may have all these problems that end up breaking my model. There's nothing wrong with what I build. The problem is when humans start trying to control nature, things go wrong. So the thing is, how can I fix that? And how can I build systems that are gonna work? I really feel the problem, the, the reason we have problems with, human, with humans and the reason they can't uh, keep nature running is really an issue of time. 
we live for about 50 years, maybe about 100 years maximum, but by the time we're 50, we all want to maximize our potential. But we're dealing with things that have been there for thousands of years. So, you know, as to worry, we end up like uh, damaging things that we, we're actually trying to improve with good intentions. So I feel like um, one of the ways we can overcome the issue with time and some of these problems is actually adopting more and more technologies. So I think pretty much by adopting technologies, the internet, the phone, computers, things that can do things over and over uh, repetitively and pretty much um, deal with some of the human inherent issues, we can build more and more sustainable systems. So the question is now, um, how do we do that? The one reason anyway those gardens work and the reason you're able to grow plants with fish is because there's two models. The first model I showed where we pretty much follow the water going around, that's the outer external model. There's also internal models happening within the ocean, such as the nitrogen cycles, that also have to be taken care of for this work. And pretty much the way they work is you take a garden, you take a tank, uh, you put in your water on a grow bed that's full of rocks. Before you put in any fish, uh, you actually have a sterile environment. And as you add your fish in, if I was to measure the concentration of chemicals going in the water against time, what I'd find is as soon as I add in my fish, ammonia would start rising. And, uh, and as soon as ammonia gets into the system, nature has it such that uh, bacteria will come in or something will come and take that space that got created because of the energy that got introduced. Uh, a form of bacteria called nitrosoma comes in, it's a nitrifying bacteria, and what it does, it pretty much feeds on ammonia, and it, um, it excretes uh, nitrate. And what it does is, as it gets more and more ammonia, it actually goes through mitosis and splits and gets into two. So the more ammonia you give it, the more food, the better an environment you create for it, the more and more they split. And so as they split more and more, they actually bring down all the ammonia down. But as they bring all the ammonia down to zero because they're eating all of it, you get a new product, which is nitrate rising again. Uh, and again, once nitrate comes in, a different bacteria comes in and pretty much starts eating your, your nitrate. And you get this action where every time something comes and takes its, or rather uses one form of energy, it creates another form of energy. And that goes on until you get to a point where you actually start creating like a nitrate, which is a form of nitrogen that but plants can actually eat. So if this was like, say, like a, your house aquarium, you have to keep changing your water because if you don't change your water, your nitrate builds up and you have to pretty much keep getting rid of algae all the time. So you get this sort of behavior as you change your nitrate over and over. The easiest way is to pretty much you build an aquaponic garden and you introduce your plants into the system. And what happens is all your chemicals come to zero. And that's called cycling. So now you pretty much implemented both of the systems. One is the one which uh, is based off the cycle that's based off the, uh, the water cycle. And the second one which is based off the nitrogen cycle. And you have a system that can create food based on, 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 on nature's methods. Uh, other things that happen is a pH will build that will be constant. And you get these other behaviors based on nitrogen. So all these things have to be maintained if you're gonna have a garden that's gonna work correctly. And I think, for me, the only way I've been able to get all these balances working is when I've been able to pretty much um, adopt, again, modern technologies. And that is uh, the internet and things like, ro uh, like robots. So the problem is, how do we build a sustainable model based off nature that's gonna work? Well, the answer is, I really don't know. Uh, but I feel we have enough tools where we can change this physical problem, which is, is, is a garden and nature, into data. And when we change it into data, then there's all other algorithms and a lot of uh, other methods and ways that are available for analyzing data that will allow us to learn. Because I think it's one of those things, as we learn about it, we can be able to get closer and closer to more sustainable systems that actually behave the way nature intended. So the way for doing that is first, you have to be able to take your physical property or physical environment, uh, be able to turn it into uh, 
uh, electrical signals, which can then get into a microprocessor or a microcontroller, so you can then turn it into binary data, and then later on change it into information that makes sense. So an example of that is like temperature, like I'm measuring and I get like 25 degrees. In order for me to be able to interface that into my computer, I need to change that temperature value into like a, a, from an analog signal into a digital signal. And so when that happens, pretty much I'm gonna get zeros, a strings of zeros, which is data, but really not information. I feel information is when I start talking about really like a, embedded in a string, like a JSON string, where I can say, okay, this is my temperature, these are my units, this is when I got it, uh, and pretty much I can build other things within data because that is not a, a, a discrete thing on its own, it makes no sense. It only makes sense when you look at it around with the other things. So the way you do that is pretty much we use sensors to uh, convert our physical environment and we build like interface circuits that allow us to pretty much to to, to change them into electrical signals and we put those into a microcontroller such as an Arduino or, or an AT mega chip, something that will pretty much understand sensors quickly and, and uh, relays, but does not necessarily have the hardcore processing logic to be able to make sense of the data. And then, in my case, I put it into a Linux microcontroller where I pretty much start dealing with data. So, I want to see if I can apply the same things to, I guess, a tank and a grow bed to see if I can apply the same sensors and algorithms, pretty much detect my environment and build uh, a sustainable model. So, uh, first thing is pretty much I have like my tank, my grow bed, I have my pump, and I have all these things. So I want to find out things like, is my tank full? Because if I have water, nothing is happening pretty much. My ocean is empty. Is my water flowing? Is like, is rain happening? You know, what are the, so all these are things you decide what you want to do. In my case, I want to find out if the grow bed is draining, if I have lakes, what my temperature is, what my light levels are. Uh, and I go get sensors pretty much that look like that, that I can buy or build and embed them into the garden. So I get my first glove interface where I can then detect whatever information that I want. Uh, I take those. Uh, put them into my uh, 80 mega or rather my microcontroller chip and then I pass them to my Linux controller. The reason I like Linux is because I get like a lot of free tools that come with it. For instance, I get like a whole layer of security and security becomes very important when you start putting things on the internet. Uh, I get uh, tools like uh, NTP, I don't have to get like a shield just to keep track of time. Uh, all that happens automatically. I have tools like uh, cron jobs which allow me to automate things, and pretty much I have things like Python and a lot of other tools that allow me then to deal with the data on a higher level. So the way I make it is my, my anti mega side does nothing but pretty much just uh, deal with sensors. Just tell me what the value of this sensor is and shoot it out as a string. Turn on this and tell me you turn it on. I, don't, I try not to write firmware for thinking because I feel that's a problem for higher level code. So I take pretty much my 80 mega creates like a JSON string. And then I take my Linux and it adds a bunch of other strings that allow me to build like uh, more uh, richer data anyway. And then uh, that's sort of the platform I use. So that's like a, a standalone uh, Arduino compatible like um, a chip that pretty much handles all the sensors. And for Linux, I use like a little router. I like using OpenRT. I can get like, say one of these for 20 bucks and hook it up to my circuit and I pretty much have like a full blown uh, system. So over time, um, there's a couple of, of different routers like I've used. Like I've used like the big one, that's like an SS router, that's the one I started with. And then this is this one that costs about 20 bucks. And then the next one you see on the side are the ones that I'm using now. And that's a full-blown Linux computer that's actually more powerful than the other two. But what gives it power is because like, I run OpenRT, which allows it to deal with the interface really well. So I take uh, pretty much, uh, take that, shoot all my data to uh, a backend database. And I run like a, a MongoDB 
for a database, which allows me, because it's sort of like a no SQL database, I don't have to build like with the traditional up-down schema, rather a sideways schema. And it has advantages because it means when I'm on the field and I add new sensors, I don't have to go in and change my database. Everything just pretty much all I do is my Arduino side and my Linux side just drops in a new JSON string and all that seamlessly drops through into the database. And then uh, on the database, I can then uh, apply more advanced tools through, through, my, um, through my more powerful server that pretty much analyzes things. And then you as the user, then access it from outside. You're just part of the data structure. So the advantage of that is, uh, and then again, I just have an API that allows me to query my database whenever I need data. So pretty much I just hit it with a call statement. I can, and I just give it like a unique name, okay, that this data comes from this garden, this data belongs to this person, and uh, I then get structures that I can tell it like, uh, give me data from this debt to this debt, give me data. So there's all these different ways that I can access my data using my API. So the advantage is like when I get it, and the way I, I pretty much request my data and it comes back as a JSON string, I'm able to do different sorts of visualization that allow me to get back to my original prob problem, which was how do I learn from my garden. So in this case, that's a visualization built out of uh, processing, which allows me now, instead of, if I was to stand in my garden physically, I can only look at my pump, or look at my water level, or I can only look at one thing at a time. But when I get the data from those things and put them uh, in, this, in this form, I can actually look at my garden at the same time. So instead of looking at one thing, I can see how the different things interrelate. Uh, and through looking at relationships, that's when I can get more data. But then it also allows me to do all sorts of different visualizations. Like I can use horizon graphs. Like that's a comparison of two different gardens, actually two different data. So the one on top is actually like one that's working OK. So when I get one that's not working OK, I can easily pick up on patterns. And without having to physically be on my garden, I can actually start finding intimate things that happen I would not normally be able to do if I was looking at a physical garden as compared to looking at my garden as data. Uh, I can do different kinds of visualization like using D3, again, to allow me to see my uh, internal, internal cycles and external cycles, internal cycles inside and create alerts and put data in ways that I can see and respond to it easily. Uh, I can use dig in and create uh, visualizations that actually allow me to look and compare different things and I can pretty much like take certain parts of my garden and actually look at them and see like how they interrelate. Like that's, these are relationships of like, I can see like what happens when my pump starts as compared to what happens to all my, how fast or slow my water is flowing inside my pumps. and how quickly it's raising in the grab bed and draining and actually see how that affects my plants and be able to fine tune it so that I can get, have actually healthier fish and healthier plants and uh, pretty much it allows me to see my garden in ways I'd not be able to see without the data. But my favorite of them all are when I get visualizations that actually the subjects create on their own. Like in this case, one of the other tools I use for visualization is like a, a uh, a time-lapse camera. So in this case, I can actually, after I look at fish at a start, certain time, they start creating all these shapes. Like, I would not catch that hockey shake, step shake if I didn't have like video documentation of it. And you can see I can actually catch like all these shapes and then the question is what do they mean on their own? So my point is, data allows me to interact with physical things differently even if it's just a garden. And by digitizing my garden and using techniques and tools from that, that pretty much robotics, applications of uh, software and algorithm that works on the internet for processing data and things like that, I can be, I feel it allows me to become an effective farmer if all I'm trying to look at is farming because traditional farmers don't have digital tools, they don't have access to social networks. They don't have access to sharing of data and things and stuff like that. So let me see. I don't know how much more time I have, but I can, uh, what's the time? Seven? Huh? 
Eight minutes. Uh, let me see if the network allows here, and then I'll see if I can uh, maybe give you guys like a little bit of a live demo. So like, um, I think if this is working, this so. Uh, I can easily control my garden by just logging in using SSH. So I'm actually connected to a garden. That's one of the cameras. Uh, I don't know what happened. But what I was going to show you guys is I can actually like, I was going to show you my garden in my office and then I would have logged in. And actually you can see me like controlling things, feeding my fish, doing all sorts of things. And if anybody has any question, this is a good time. Oh, GBR, Grobet. Grobet is a... Uh, I think that was probably look at the level of the water inside. So pretty much, because um, what happens is, as the water rises up and down inside the, inside the garden, what it does is it acts like a diaphragm. You can think of it as it rises, it pushes out the stale air, and when it comes down, it acts like a vacuum that sucks in fresh air. So if that's not happening, pretty much you're not oxygenating your bacteria, which culture the garden, which actually culture surfaces in the garden, and at the same time your plants don't have enough oxygen, sort of thing, okay? Yeah, yeah, so like the animation I showed earlier on, like the one, the one that was with the diagram, those are actually all live. Yeah, so those are pretty much the... Um, Respond like, if the pump goes on, the colors go blue. If there's a lake, you'll see like blue at the bottom. So it's actually like a visual animation. The whole idea is I can look at it and see what's happening without dealing with details. Yeah? What are you measuring in the water? Uh, uh, for now, pH, uh, TDS, oxygen, oxygen reduction, and stuff like that. different sensors, and then each one throws in uh, a, a string of its own. Yeah. And um, if you guys want to find out more, I teach classes in Auckland. Uh, I teach like a DIY aquaponics class, so you can learn how to build your own garden, and also a DIY Internet of Things class, usually like once a month. I have some flyers here, if you want to pick one up on your way out. Okay? Okay. Thank you.